first i want to um i want to start with some uh, dismantling a free a few preconceptions before we start developing some concepts and uh, so i thought i'd start with a case because that's really always where we find ourselves and i want to teach this whole course in a case based manner uh, with cases to work with and a discussion of why are we choosing this potency in this particular case why are we treating it in this manner um, I think that works a lot better than learning through theory and then trying to apply theory upwards to uh, application. So this is a 21-year-old woman who presented with a chief complaint of sinus infection. Uh, it's been two weeks now. It started as a cold. Uh, she says, my, my snot, her nasal discharge has thickened up and it's dripping down my throat. Uh, my throat and my nose feel raw. And objectively observe that she's doing a lot of you know, snorting, you know, clearing her throat, spitting a thick discharge into her handkerchief, and frequently blowing her nose throughout the entire interview. Uh, the nasal discharge, um, or what she calls his snot, is thick and yellow to yellow-green, and it's streaked with blood. Um, and again, you know, she describes this for me, but I'm also looking in her hank when she's, when she's spitting out the uh, discharge that she's raised. She said, I've had several small nosebleeds this week, uh, bright red blood, easily managed, uh, didn't last long. Um, I think they were from blowing too hard and rubbing my nose and blowing to dislodge these chunks. And she demonstrates to me, she, she um, reaches up on the side of her nose and rubs down the side of her nose from the nasal cartilage, the hard part there, toward the nostril, and then blows firmly and produces a blood-streaked greenish-yellow chunk of uh, pretty firm uh, discharge about the size of a split pea. She says, my nose feels raw and itchy inside, and it's worse breathing through my nose. Mostly, though, it's plugged. So she mentions it's worse breathing through her nose, so I asked, uh, cold air or warm air bothers more? And she says, cold air. With cold air, it feels raw and itching, and my nose runs more when I'm out in the cold. Warm air inside, it's more plugged. Outside, cold air especially, it runs more. She says riding in the car is the worst with the heater on. And it's November in Maine, so when she's out riding in the car, she's got the heater on. And, and I say worst with, and she says plugged up. I can't breathe through it with the car heater on. She says I'm sneezing a lot when I first wake up in the morning and when I'm out in the sun, uh, when I'm outside, or if I'm in a sunny spot in the house. Okay. Now I could go on with the case. There's a bit more in the case, but this is the heart of it. Mentally, emotionally, there was nothing of interest in the case um, at, at all. Um, and I, I've, I've condensed the case just a little bit for our purposes here tonight. So, um, um, by, by the way, I, I hope that you guys all weigh in with comments and questions. You probably see the little question box in your GoToWebinar control panel, and that lets you send questions both to me and Lori. And when you send in questions or comments, um, we'll review those and, and address them live um, online here. So um, keep them coming. I think this is a little bit more fun when it's interactive. And when I, I, I know that I'm talking to somebody instead of just a, um, a, a void <laughs> out there somewhere. So at least say hello. <laughs> so what did I do? I gave, I gave her golden seal tincture. Um, I said four drops in a little water, three times daily. Okay, go next door to the food co-op, buy a bottle of Golden Seal tincture, four drops in a little bit of water, three times daily. So here's my question. Um, oh, follow up. She was much better the following morning. Considerable improvement, and fully resolved over the course of three days uh, using the Golden Seal tincture. So here's my question, is this homeopathic, was this homeopathic care that I provided? Or should we label it botanical or eclectic or naturopathic or allopathic or perhaps, because it was an herb, green allopathic? Um, is this treatment suppressive? Is it palliative? Is it curative? Um, I, I think regarding the last three questions, suppressive, palliative, or curative, time will tell. And uh, our intent um, sometimes is the road to good. Uh, how's that go? Road to, you know how that saying goes. 
Uh, our intent may not dictate this, but um, uh, in the future we'll be able to see was this suppressive, palliative, or curative. But in terms of how we label this treatment, how do we go? So let's take a look at this case. Let's go back and take a look at the case. If I'm to organize this for analysis, um, and here I'll use the bedding housing X diagram. Um, the locality is nasal mucosa, facial sinuses, a subset of that, um, or upper respiratory mucosa in a very general sense. So my descriptors and my modalities here should pertain to basically upper respiratory mucosa, perhaps specifically nasal and, and sinus. And any concomitants in other organ systems would go here in concomitants. So descriptors, um, discharge, posterioraries, viscid and thick, yellow to yellow-green, blood-streaked, in chunks. Nosebleeds are bright red. They seem to be aggravated by blowing or rubbing the nose, so perhaps I should call that a, a modality here. Her nose is obstructed. Um, uh, she is sneezing on waking in the morning and in the sun, so we should call that a modality as well. Okay. Uh, the pace is insidious. It, it comes out of a prolonged cold. And uh, some clear modalities in the case. She's worse breathing through the nose, and she's worse with cold air. Specifically, it's the itching, raw, and discharge that are worse with cold air. And, um, um, and she's also worse with warm air, in that the obstruction is worse in warm air. And of course, we can add these modalities. Blowing or rubbing the nose specifically seems to be uh, a, a proximate cause of nosebleeds and sun of sneezing. So I like to put down, you know, things that are jumping into my mind. Um, I, I, you know, remedies, therapies that I might be thinking of uh, off the cuff. And uh, there's some aspects of this case that sound a great deal like calibacromicum. Um, thick and viscid, chunks, yellow to yellow-green, blood streaked, irritating, so we'd expect a raw and itching nose with the excoriating discharges this creates, um, etc. Um, and we see calibacromicum is a very common remedy in these purulent rhinitises and sinusitises. So the reason I put calibacromicum down here is less to secure this as a potential remedy for the case and more to get it out of my mind so that I can come back and do a good objective analysis. Um, next thing I need to do is prioritize these symptoms and identify a minimal syndrome of maximal value to take to analysis. Now, sadly, I'm missing concomitants, and um, homeopaths hate to be in that situation. Concomitants are like that third leg on a milking stool. They lend it stability. So I already know that my work is a little bit out for me here. So I'll start, um, first the locality. Rather than take a rubric specifically for a locality, I'm going to imply locality in some of the rubrics that I pick for descriptions and modalities. Okay, So I won't have just a, a rubric for affect, you know, affections of the sinuses or whatever. Okay, So description of the discharge, um, thick and viscid. So I'm probably going to look for a, dis, uh, a rubric, nose, discharge, thick, viscid. Okay. Um, Having picked a descriptor, I'm now going to go pick a, a modality, right? I want to represent each quadrant as best I can. So I've just implied the nasal mucosa with picking nose discharge thick viscid. I'll now look for a modality, and I thought the warm air with obstruction was particularly strongly stated in the case, so I'll take it next. Um, since I don't have a concomitant to take, and I've already dealt with the locality, I'll come back and pick another descriptor, but I want to pick one that doesn't have to do with discharge now. Uh, to spread out my description of this story. So I think the aggravation, the sun, sneezing on sun is interesting. Sneezing on waking, I'm not so excited about. She's lying down, gravity accumulation of, of, of uh, discharge in the nose, maybe that makes sense. It's not as exciting to me. But the sneezing in the sun, I thought was particularly interesting. Um, you know what, I've asterisked it, and I'll talk about that asterisk in a minute. Um, it's something I know now that I won't know until I go look at rubrics. So I'll, I'll talk about it then. Come back to modalities now for another. Um, and I'm going to pick the cold air aggravates. And I thought it was particularly interesting that both cold air and warm air aggravate. And this is a case of a, uh, of a polarity in the case, uh, an apparent contradiction. And of course, it, this apparent contradiction resolves itself in that different things are aggravated, right? It's the, 
the itching, the rawness, and the discharge aggravated by cold air, and the obstruction aggravated by warm air. But I still think it's interesting to take them both, okay, in these contexts. And I allow myself a maximum of six rubrics for an analysis. I think when I put more than six rubrics into analysis, my observation is that I'm confused about the case and I need to go back for clarity and identify that minimal syndrome of maximal value uh, instead of just throwing in a bunch of data into the case. So I'll come back and look for a descriptor that's not about discharge and not about sneezing. And I thought the rawness, or you could argue me into taking itching in the nose. Either of these would, would feel fine. You could probably me, argue me into taking bright red abystaxis as well. But um, I thought these were a little more compelling um, to take here. We'll get the same result no matter what we do here. And analyzing these, um, here I've, I've combined several rubrics for the sneezing and the sunshine, and these will count as one together in the analysis. And the reason I put an asterisk by this is because I recognized already back in the analysis, this is going to be small. Okay, Not a lot of sneezing in the sun in our literature. One rubric has nine remedies, the rest each have one. And the whole combination, when I make a combined rubric out of these um, uh, these five rubrics together, that combination only includes 12 remedies, which is dicey. That's not a mama bear. That's a baby bear-sized rubric, too small to rest on. So for this analysis, I'm going to hedge my bets. I'm going to weight that at zero so that I can see the rubric, the remedies in here in my analysis, but they won't count toward my ordering of remedies. Okay. Here I combine two rubrics for uh, um, Carriza aggravated, uh, Carriza with discharge aggravated in open air. Okay. Uh, this is a very interesting one with only five remedies. Um, Carriza discharge um, with discharge aggravated in the open air, but without a discharge in a room, which is very much what she describes, but it's a very small rubric, not big enough to trust on its own. So I'm combining these two to be more complete. And then uh, raw pain in the nose. And again, this could have been the nasal itching, this could have been the epistaxis, um, depending on how you prioritized these, and we'll end up with the same result. And you can see here that the remedies that I really should entertain, because they're in the one, two, three, four rubrics that count are hydrastis canadensis, sulfur, and sabadella. Okay. And of these, hydrastis is mentioned in the sneezing, aggravated in the sunshine. Okay. It's also in this small rubric of uh, uh, discharge in open air, but without discharge in a room. Okay. So reading about, you know, sulfur shows up here because it's a very big remedy. Um, it's going to elbow its way into most analyses. Reading about Sabadella, um, short read, even the first paragraph in Patak, I think it's hard to sustain in this case. Um, reading about Hydrastis, fits this case like a glove. And I ended up giving Hydrastis canadensis golden seal. And in fact, Hydrastis canadensis is homeopathic to this case. Okay. Whether I give this in tincture or in potency. So I think we can go back now and look at my question of is this, do we have to call this intervention naturopathic? Do we have to call it eclectic? Do we have to call it botanical? Um, or whatever, and call it homeopathic. And when we come down to the questions of is it going to be suppressive, palliative, or curative, I think we can predict rather confidently that this will be a curative result in this case. So I think this comes back to a very fundamental aspect of the whole question of dose and potency. I think when most people are asked about homeopathy, is you describe homeopathy to me, the answer goes something on the order of we give very small doses of a substance similar to the one that could be causing your problem. And I think, although, you know, it's probably the explanation I often offer to people, I think that legitimately that description is a little bit backwards in that what's most important is that we're giving a substance similar to the pathology that we're seeing. We're giving a substance which could create the symptomatology of the case. And the question of how much we're going to give, what potency we're going to give, whether we're going to give that in crude form or in one of our potentized preparations, is a secondary question that comes after 
the determination of an appropriate remedy. If we look back at the history of the development of dose and potency in homeopathy, and there's a paper I wrote a, a few years ago that I'm, I'll be posting for the course and, and actually updating um, for this course because it's time one looked at it again. Hahnemann began early in his practice using terms like Verdinnung and Verkleinen, um, meaning to dilute or to diminish a dose of a remedy. Um, early on when he began practicing. And I think the reason that he was looking in this way is that he was working initially early on in practice with a lot of pretty toxic substances. Okay. Um, some of Hahnemann's early remedies, he describes belladonna, aconite, arsenic. All of these are, as, as you see on the bottle here, pretty poisonous stuff. And uh, in the conventional medicine of his day, these were used in crude doses, sometimes small, sometimes largish crude doses. And Hahnemann got to see a lot of the effects of this. Um, I think we could uh, um, call these side effects if we wanted, but uh, there are no side effects, are they? There's, there's effects and there's things that aren't effects. Um, so early on, Hahnemann got to see a lot of these effects of remedies, the effects of belladonna in high potencies, the effects of arsenic, the effects of aconite, the effects of other toxic substances. And in trying to achieve gentle cure in his cases, the first thing he did was say, I think I need to dilute or diminish the dose of these in order that I get their curative responses, their responses in healing, but I don't get a lot of the toxicity that accompanies these powerful medicinal substances that I'm using. But a lot of the things that we use in practice today, as well as in Hahnemann's day, are not that toxic. You know, remedies like golden seal, um, uh, like calendula, like sanguinaria, bloodroot, these are all substances that are uh, uh, relatively innocuous in, in standard doses. We can, you know, we can take tincture doses, we can take doses of teas and, and won't be inordinately poisoned by these. These are things we can buy and employ in botanic, eclectic medical practice, naturopathic medical practice in their crude form and see healing effects from these. So how does this differ from giving a remedy in potency? Okay. Now, how does the use of golden seal and tincture differ from the use of, of uh, golden seal um, in tincture versus in, uh, in, in these developed potencies that we have and commonly employ? So let's look at this whole question initially of, of dilution and diminishing and see how this has played out in, in homeopathy. And guys, if I can remind you once more, I'm really hoping to be fueled in the latter part of this um, talk by, by questions from you. So start pouring in the questions. I don't see any yet here. So um, um, Laurie, if, if you're getting them and, and they're not visible to you, me, you might need to change my, my status here. So I'm sure to be able to see them. So if we go back and look at some of our classical literature, let's look at uh, William Borkey, uh in his Materia Medica. Um, and I'm just going to pick a few you know, re reasonably known remedies from the A's and, and one from the B's. Um, I mean, we, I could produce hundreds of examples of this throughout Borkey's text. But here in, in a textbook of homeopathy uh, from the early 1900s, um, description of aconitum, Nepalis, okay, of aconite. Um, and he recommends in neuralgias, the tincture of the root is often preferable in one drop doses. Okay, so here's a homeopathic prescription. Tincture of the root of aconite in one drop doses. Aeschylus hippocastanum, okay, horse chestnut. In engorgements of the rectum and in piles with great pain, 10 drop doses of tincture every two hours. Elytris farinosa. Tincture to the third potency. In Berberus vulgaris, tincture to the sixth potency. So um, now, I don't believe Borkey is suggesting that we restrict our practice to these potencies, but um, he, you know, he's recounting potencies that have been useful in his practice and those of his colleagues. And we're looking pretty low here, a lot of tincture doses. And all through Borkey's Materia Medica, we're gonna see references to tincture doses such as this. So is this a variation, a deviation from Hahnemann's teachings? Um, Constantine Herring, who I think we can accept as an extremely solid homeopathic 
physician and, 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 and formative in the development of our art and science, describes here in his description of Belladonna as a clinically confirmed symptom, a girl approximately 20, suddenly attacked with genital itching after three months, eight drops of Belladonna tincture in six ounces of water, every three hours a tablespoonful as a homeopathic prescription. You can't get much more solidly homeopathic than Constantine Herring. So let's look a little bit at, at, uh, at how this use of such low potencies can be um, accepted into conventional homeopathic practice. If we look at the development in over Hahnemann's lifetime of dose and potency, his uh, Peruvian bark experiment, you know, when he took uh, um, uh, kina bark, the, the bark that contains quinine, okay, in 1790 and developed symptoms suggestive of malaria, um, which was his eureka experience, the experience in which he, he became aware of the properties of similars and proposed this as a uh, uh, perhaps a universal property was in 1790. Okay. His, uh, the birth of homeopathy probably occurred about 1796. Hahnemann was not rash to take new discoveries and impose them on his, um, on his followers. Okay, six years here between that experiment and his essay on a new principle for ascertaining the curative powers of drugs. This is when he comes out you know, basically comes out of the closet on homeopathy and starts talking about this as perhaps a universal method of cure. Now, over the next three years, if we look at Hahnemann's notes, we, we find that he was experimenting in his publications, that he was experimenting with small crude doses of medicines, um, giving crude doses, tincture doses, perhaps smaller than those used in his colleagues' Um, work in conventional medicine, but sometimes not smaller, uh, sometimes pretty substantial doses of these. And then over the next 30 years, from 1799 to 1829, we see him experimenting with small doses to high attenuations. But during this time, when we read Hahnemann's writings, look at his publications, we find that basically he was experimenting to identify a small, a sufficiently small dose of substance, okay, still crude doses, a sufficiently small dose that would suffice to heal, but would avoid creating toxic effects um, in the course of that healing. Okay, in the course of this experimentation, the first edition of the Organon was published in 1810. In 1825, he wrote a very interesting article, and um, this was actually in response to a challenge to a critical article in the literature that was extremely critical of his small doses and, and suggested it would take many globes of water the size of the earth to prepare remedies in the potencies that he, he was talking about. And, and of course, Hahnemann recognized this uh, to be just ludicrous um, criticism of him. He wrote an article called Information for the Truth Seeker, which is published in one of the journals of his day. And in, in this, he has a very interesting sentence. And you can see his thought changing here. He says, in reality, Dilution is potentizing, not merely a material splitting up and lessening. So around this time, he began to discover that, um, that in the process of diluting a remedy, we're doing something that isn't merely a matter of, of lowering the dose and reducing the possibility of toxicity of the substance, but something kind of magical and perhaps unexplainable is happening to the remedy that actually potentizes it, that brings out its medicinal properties. And he began experimenting through this time with, with smaller and smaller doses, serial dilutions of remedies, etc., um, eventually getting up around um, 1829 to 30 C, uh, what we would today recognize as a 30 C potency. In fact, in 1829, um, he wrote a letter to Schrader and Korsakoff. Um, some of his uh, protégés were at this point experimenting with higher potencies going further and further on into 200, what we would now recognize to be 200C and 1M potencies and so on. And he wrote them a letter urging them to cease experimentation beyond the 30C. Okay, he felt it was opening us up to potential criticism and perhaps there was more need to standardize our methods and perhaps call 30C a boundary line b b beyond which we would not uh, proceed. Uh, fortunately, his protégés did not listen to him and continued their experimentations 
but Hahnemann himself, at least for the time being, held the line at 30C. And we'll see that it took him 30 years of experimentation with homeopathy to get up to a 30C potency, a potency that we today often consider a, a relatively low potency in most of our work today. So 30 years of convincing himself that homeopathy is the greatest thing since sliced bread before he got up to a potency that we, today we might consider rather on the low end. Okay. In the fifth edition of the Organon in 1833, he went so far as to recommend 30C as a standard potency around this time. And he passed away 10 years after that, 1843. Now we're going to talk about some of his other developments along the way, and particularly the development in here of administering remedies in, in repeated aqueous doses in water um, and of uh, LM potencies and so on. We're going to take up in detail in the, in the actual course. But here, here's a, a, the seg section from Hahnemann's article, Information for the Truth Seeker, published in 1825. He says, for hundreds of years, nothing was known of the power of many crude medicinal substances. These, if made into a solution, can, by repeated shakings or by long-continued trituration, grinding with non-medicinal powder, be worked up to very intensive medicines with marvelous effects. By triturating or shaking, the latent medicinal power is wonderfully liberated and vitalized, as if once freed from the fetters of matter. I love that, isn't it? The medicinal, latent medicinal power is wonderfully liberated and vitalized, as if once freed from the fetters of matter, it could act upon the human organism more intensely and fully. In reality, diluting is not potentizing, not merely a material splitting up and lessening in which every part must be smaller than the whole, but a spiritualizing. And, and we have to understand that word. This is not meant as spiritual. This is meant as, as making immaterial, okay, if we translate this correctly from the German. But a making immaterial of the inner medicinal powers by removing the covering of nature's forces and the palpable substance which can be weighed no longer enters into consideration. And he began using terms such as dynamization, dynamisha, uh, dynamisirt, um, translated English below, uh, potenzierung, potence, or potentization and potency, rather than using the terms dilution at this stage. Now, I think it's interesting that um, Hahnemann did not really have an appreciation of Avogadro's constant, okay? Avogadro actually lived in kind of this era, okay, during Hahnemann's lifetime, but Avogadro did not come up with Avogadro's constant. It was named for him by Jean Perrin, okay? Um, it, uh, in fact, in Hahnemann's day, the whole idea of the, the notion of, of infinite divisibility versus finite divisibility of matter, whether matter was made of discrete substance that could only be finitely um, dissected, or could be infinitely divided. That, that was a matter of philosophical discussion and debate during Hahnemann's lifetime. And it wasn't until John Dalton came around somewhere in the midst of Hahnemann's lifetime and, and proposed the notion of, um, you know, took the old concept of the atom, right, the indivisible substance, and actually provided some experimental evidence for this. And later, when uh, Loschmidt and Perrin uh, between 1865 and 1908 09 actually calculated the sizes of, a, of, of atoms and of molecules and then calculated a constant and told us how many times you can divide matter and still have something left, okay? So Hahnemann didn't know that in diluting something 1 to 130 times we would get beyond the presence of material substance in our material. But I think he anticipated this idea and describes it here with this idea that when we dilute we begin to move away from representing what we have in in uh, in matter, and and release its material, I its medicinal powers. Now let's take a look at this. We we know that aconite in large doses. That's a large aconite there. Okay, we know that aconite in large doses can cause, for example, restless anxiety and fear of death. Okay, we know this. We we can do poisonings with it, we can do provings of it. And we know, in practice, that aconite can cure restless anxiety with fear of death, according to the principle of similars and, 
and uh, a couple hundred years of convincing clinical evidence for this. We happen to know that aconite can cure restless anxiety with fear of death, even in extremely tiny doses, even in these doses that, that go beyond chemical plausibility and that lay us open to the criticisms of people who, who uh, feel that physical presence of molecules in our remedies are essential to their action. Okay? We also know that aconite in very small doses, in these very small doses as well, can cause restless anxiety and fear of death. In fact, in the fifth edition of the Organon, aphorism 128, Hahnemann tells us that provings that we do, he says the plan we adopt for provings is to give the experimenter daily from four to six very small globules of the 30th potentized dilution of a 30C of such substance. And although his provings earlier in his career were often with toxic doses and material doses of substance, at this point he suggested that we do our provings with these highly potentized remedies, 30C potency, which is diluted well beyond Avogadro's number, well beyond the dose at which we could expect physical material presence of molecules of our original substance to remain in the diluted substance. Okay. A 30C is diluted 1 to 130 times, so the dilution is, is 100 to the minus 30th, should be a minus there, which is 10 to the minus 60th. Okay, Avogadro's number is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So this is diluted way, way, way beyond the point at which we would expect material presence to remain in our substance. So 30C is not really a very low potency, pretty high potency. And yet, we can do our provings with these tiny doses. Okay, We can even go beyond and do provings with 1Ms, 200Cs, which is very popular today in provings. Okay, So I want to ask this whole question of what is the relationship between a remedy being able to cause a symptom and a remedy be able to cure a symptom? Because I think we often hear the notion that these tiny doses, these tiny doses we use, these potentized remedies, can cure symptoms that could be caused by high doses of the substance. And that this, this difference, this, this idea of cure by similars is somehow based on the size of the dose. And I want to talk about that just a little bit. You know, we often find reference to the Arndt Schultz quote rule or quote law. Okay, this was proposed by uh, by Hugo Schultz and and Rudolf Arndt, circa 1888, and the Arndt Schultz law proposes that in very small doses a substance is stimulating to the organism, crosses a threshold in moderate doses, and at high doses is toxic, until we move to even higher doses and is lethal, and suggests that this is a rule or law that applies to substances that can act on our physiology. Okay? When I went to medical school, this was still taught as a rule or law. Small doses stimulatory, high doses toxic. However, what's very interesting about this is um, Arndt and Schultz elevated this observation that they made on a few substances. This was first made on, on substances that were toxic to yeasts, okay, that in very low doses stimulated yeast growth and in very high doses inhibited yeast growth. Okay? And on, on, on a rather limited experience with a few substances, they generalized this to suggest it was a rule or law of nature that might apply to all substances. And what we see is that it in fact doesn't. And in fact, the Arndt Schultz phenomenon, is perhaps what we should call this, applies only to a very few substances. Um, um, in fact, if you Google Arndt Schultz rule or on Schultz law, you're going to find that most of the references that come up relate to attempted explanations on why homeopathy works and why low-dose um, uh, laser stimulation works and so on. Some of these alternative therapies that are trying to explain themselves based on some rule or law of nature that may or may not actu actually apply to them. Now, the, the funny thing about the Unschultz phenomenon is the suggestion that this activity should be stimulatory in general to the organism and toxic in general to the organism. And we know that when we're dealing with homeopathic remedies, we're not merely talking about stimulating in a nondescript way. We're talking about having very specific effects on the organism. 
So, you know, if we apply it to our homeopathy, it would suggest that maybe in tiny doses, aconite would stimulate the organism, and in very high doses, it would be toxic to the organism and cause symptoms, okay? But, you know, this isn't actually what we see, is it? Because, you know, in, uh, in, in very small doses, we see that aconite can actually cause symptoms. We can get good provings off very tiny, even, quote, immaterial, unquote, doses of aconite. It doesn't merely stimulate in low doses and cure in, uh, I, I'm sorry, stimulate in low doses and, and provide toxicity in high doses, okay? That doesn't seem to be what the property of similars relates to at all. In fact, what we find in the world today is that most substances, when studied, we can see three kinds of dose response curves. There are some substances that um, in very low dose are a little bit toxic and in very high dose are very toxic. We have kind of a linear or maybe not quite so linear relationship in, in the dose response um, curve here. We find other substances that in low doses do nothing and at a threshold level begin to be toxic. Okay, or toxic to the organism. And we find a few substances where the phenomenon now known as hormesis applies. And, and hormesis is the modern reincarnation of the Arndt Schultz observation. Okay, so we find a, a few substances in which low doses may in some way stimulate the organism and in higher doses be toxic to the organism. But it's not a universal law, it doesn't apply to everything. I want to suggest in going back, those of you who were involved in the acute care class and looking at C.S. Howling's adaptive cycle that I'm using to, kind of, to understand health and disease. Um, you know, in health we have growth and homeostatic phases here, okay? And what categorizes health with growth and homeostasis is incremental innovations, small innovations that adapt the organism to the changing conditions of its environment. Small changes that adapt, okay? And that um, in disease, we see radical innovations, rather in your face, sudden, um, major changes that we recognize as symptomatology, okay? They, a, di a different characteristic than just the descriptors of someone in health. Now, aconite, if we give this in a high dose to someone, brings about a medicinal disease, okay? Sends the organism into this medicinal phase, um, um, disease phase, or, or the uh, back loop behavior of Holling's adaptive cycle, okay? And uh, aconite given in disease, when it's a similimum, okay? When it bears similarity to the case, acts on this process of radical innovation and brings the organism back into health, okay? And so what seems to be the difference between these apparently opposite properties of a substance, okay, in that in some situations it can cause symptoms, in others it can cure those symptoms, is what the state of the organism is in when it receives them, okay? So aconite given to someone in health creates a medicinal disease that we recognize as aconite's medicinal disease, the proving of aconite. Aconite given to someone in disease that matches aconite moves on to cure. And this is why the apparent opposite effect has nothing to do with dose. Because an aconite, aconite can do this in tincture doses. It can do this in reduced potencies, in the high potencies that we use today. In the same way, we can create the medicinal diseases of aconite by doing provings in the 30C, the 200C, the 1M potency. And we can see aconite medicinal disease emerge by exposing the healthy organism even to these very tiny doses. So this apparent opposite effect of creating versus curing symptoms is really nothing to do with dose. It has to do with the situation in which the organism finds itself and its receptivity to the substance based on that situation. So the question is, when do we pick one? When do we pick a, a potency? When do we use aconite and tincture? And when do we use it in a highly diminished dose? And there's a lot that's been said about this. And I'm going to go into a, a variety of approaches. I'm going to teach you my approach, which, of, of course, is the best. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's meant to be a joke. Um, um, 
But um, I want to uh, look at a number of approaches to determination of ideal dose and potency and so that we can look at these and, and try to find the common themes that run through them and maybe understand a little bit about a universal law of dose and potency. And if we can't discern that, at least to look at the variations that are available to us. But I want to tell a story first. And this is from one of my early teachers in homeopathy. And um, this is a fellow who was apprenticing with one of the old timers. He was apprenticing with Macy Penos, um, who was um, you know, one of the last of the old guard of homeopaths in North America. And um, he came up with a case. And I've, I, don't, I may have recalled this a little differently. But I, I, as I recall, it was a case of Dirka Palustris, a small remedy not a remedy we commonly encounter. And he called her up and I said, I have this great case. I think it's Durka Palustris. And she said, run it by me. And he did. And she said, brilliant, great prescription. And he said, what potency should I give? And Macy said, I would give a DM potency. Now, Macy was known for her high potency prescribing. So a DM is a 50,000 C potency. Okay, So that's diluted 10 to 100,000 times, right? 100 to 50,000 is 10 to 100,000 times. Um, and again, we pass Avogadro's number at 10 to the 23rd. So this is is m an incredibly high potency. I don't, I've never given a DM potency in, in my career. Um, no, some, some folks do this frequently, you know. But I, okay. So um, he said, I don't have it. And she said, what do you have? And he said, I have a 6C. And she says, that'll do. Okay. So one of the first things I want to say about dose and potency is it may not be the most important thing that we have to consider. Maybe the most important thing is that we, um, um, is that we pick a potency, we, we pick a remedy that works, and we pick a potency that's reasonable and that we have. Okay. Now, certainly there are optimizations, and there are cases in which Perhaps a 6C is a better choice, and perhaps other cases in which a DM is a better choice. Um, but that I think locked out of some potencies, I think we can generally make do with the potencies we have. I think that Stephen Stills channeled this for us um, in you know the, the upcoming 7th edition of the Organon, of course, which is, as those of you who know me, I firmly believe is being channeled by rock and roll musicians, right? And, and Stephen Stills says, of course, if you can't give the dose you have, um, give the dose you're with, right? Okay. I'm sorry, I will not sing it for you. So, <laughs> so another question we have. So um, I, I want to move away a little bit. We're going to talk a lot about how to pick which dose, which potency. I hope there's some questions today about that. I think it's best if we learn those in the context of cases. And move along to this question of what do we do next? What about repetition of dose? This is an interesting question as well. And I think that um, James Tyler Kent, in his lecture on the second prescription given at the, IH, uh, sorry, the IHA conference in Niagara Falls in, in 1888, is probably one of the best descriptions of this. Um, he says, how long should I wait and watch? This is a question frequently asked, but seldom answered. I presume that most good prescribers will say we have often acted too soon, but never waited too long. Many physicians fail because of not waiting, and yet the waiting can't just be mindless waiting. It must be governed by knowledge. So how do we discern when to repeat a remedy? Um, Hahnemann, later in his career, uh, began giving remedies commonly in gentle repetitive doses by putting them in water. Well, first by giving them in repeated dry doses, but subsequently by putting them in water for more elegant delivery and nudging disease along rather than giving a single dose and waiting and watching. And I want to talk about both of these approaches because I think both have been well developed in the modern world. Um, both um, um, uh, what do we do with high potencies and our need to wait between doses and how can we nudge a disease gently along by using more gentle potencies and, and gentle repetition. And, and how do we d discern those intervals between doses and repetition? There's another topic I wanted to bring up, which is dose. And dose and potency are not really the same thing. Okay, Hahnemann also used the words GABA 
dosis, a giving, or a dose. Okay, and he seemed to separate these out a little bit from dilution and dynamization and potentization. How do we actually dose a remedy? I, I know I was trained with the notion that, um, you know, you got one pellet, you got fifty pellets. Um, none of them have anything in them, so what's fifty times nothing? Um, giving somebody fifty pellets, giving them one pellet, should be the same thing. And in part, this actually derives from Sweden, from Kent's imposing a Swedenborgian ethic or philosophy of simple substance um, on our medications in suggesting that our medicines possess quality but not quantity. This kind of fourth dimension of matter that Swedenborg described, which is a substance that can have quality properties but not quantity. Okay, and this this uh, rang well with Kent, who who uh, believed he saw Swedenborgian philosophy reflected in Hahnemann's writings, and suggested that uh, it, it's not really relevant that one remedy, fifty one pellet, fifty pellets, all should be much the same, you know. And yet we find Hahnemann insisting on giving the smallest quantity, one pellet, okay, um, subsequently suggesting the smallest portion of one pellet by dissolving it in water, okay? And um, and then giving small sips of this liquid um, rather than even giving a whole pellet. Not not not, uh, not succussing this, because we don't want to increase the potency. We just want to dilute. You know, dilution provides the opportunity for increase in potency, which is developed by succussion or trituration. You're just diluting this out so that each sip is a small fraction of that pellet, okay? So Hahnemann seemed to perceive a difference between giving 50 remedies in one pellet or even be giving one pellet and giving a portion of one pellet. And so I want to talk a lot about that and how we can optimize dose. You know, when I was trained, I was taught to uh, give three pellets once as your standard dose. And the, the belief was that um, maybe in that vial there's some pellets that didn't get medicated, you see. So if I only give one pellet, maybe I've given you a blank you know, one that doesn't have any medication on it, and uh, and then it won't work. So maybe if I give you two pellets, there's a better chance of getting active remedy in your dose. It's unlikely that two pellets go unmedicated, but two is a really awkward number. So let's give you three pellets, and then we're sure to have unmedicated. Um, you know, one or two of them are going to be medicated. Okay, those of you who've made remedies, and you take a vial of unmedicated pellets, and you put one drop of that 95% alcohol with your remedy in it on those pellets and just roll that tube around, we'll know that the idea of any unmedicated pellet in that vial is ludicrous. It, it cannot happen, okay? That that alcohol just immediately wicks around and coats all of those vials, all of those pellets evenly and is absorbed into them. So um, this whole idea of having to give three pellets or a whole vial of pellets to avoid one pellet being a blank is... Um, is not really reasonable. But um, how do we dose? Do we give one pellet? Do we give three pellets? Do we give 50 pellets? What's the difference between those? What's the difference in terms of the effect on the organism um, of those? Is it better perhaps to dissolve that pellet in water and give even a fraction of the pellet, even a smaller dose of the remedy? And how does that help us when it comes to repetition? I didn't have it in potency. I didn't have it. I didn't have it. I didn't have it. And the co-op next door didn't have it in potency in their little display of 30C remedies, you know? They had a small supply. And for some reason, I was, I mean, I usually keep it in stock, but I didn't have it. So I sent them next door and I said, buy a vial of tincture, you know? That should work fine. So, you know, we'll get, so that's one answer. Okay, that's one answer. Another answer is sometimes it's about the side of the bed I get out of in the morning. There's some days that I would just wake up and I'm jazzed and I walk out in the garden and I want to give plants, you know? And I want to know what the plants are and I have a more tangible connection to them in tincture, you know? Maybe there's even a picture of one on the label. And for those of you in Maine, I am so sorry that I picked Herbal Ed's. Um, he's a great guy, he makes great herbs. I picked an herb farm file. I really gave Avena Botanicals golden seal there, okay? And um, 
But you know, the Avena set has these little tiny pictures of their vials and didn't have one big enough for the slide. So that's why that wasn't there. So I, you know, I like to feel that connection. Um, um, I have a good friend back in Maine who, who runs the Avena Botanicals Company, Deb Soul, uh, is my child's, my children's uh, goddess mother, was there at their births. And um, sometimes I love to honor her practice. So that's a second answer to that question. And the third answer is sometimes it's the best choice. And in this case, in this case, I had a pretty one-sided case that was all about tissue, okay? Everything, as when we get to my symptom hierarchy pyramid, we'll talk about this. Everything on that diagram, other than a couple modalities, were low on that symptom hierarchy diagram, and even the modalities were local, okay? And were not general modalities. So everything was kind of low, and that tells me, go with low potency, okay? And, and um, we'll talk about what that means. What does it mean about a case when symptoms are local? Does that, I don't think that just means we're dealing with local disease because I don't think there is such a thing, okay? But what is happening to the organism when the organism is only expressing symptoms locally or regionally and not expressing them systemically, okay? Um, so, um, um, but here, when I'm seeing a case like that, I'm going to go low potency. I probably on most days would give that a 12C or a 30C. Okay. How low can you go? <laughs> <laughs> Where's the limbo rod there? Um, I, I, you know, with especially with things like mercurius, where we know that even small doses accumulate in the body, I'm not going to go with material doses. I'm, I'm probably, I, I don't see a problem with using mercurius in 6Cs, but I just probably don't go below 12C with those, okay? No sods, I feel itchy when I start to get material dose, especially of serinum, right? So I'm probably not going to go to material doses of serinum or, or tuberculinum or, or gonorrhea, you know, no sod, you know, metarinum, and yeah, you know, yucky stuff. So I'm probably going to stay above 12C with most of those things. Um, but when we're looking at... Um, at herbs that are commonly used by the herbalists around us, um, I'll often go to tincture. And I think it's really fascinating that, you know, we have from the other end, you know, right, from the botanical practitioner's end, we have Matthew Wood now, you know, using highly individualized prescriptions of botanical substances and using drop doses of tincture, um, you know, coming back to a very kind of homeopathic um, kind of approach often not choosing the remedy on a basis of similitude, you know, choosing the remedy on a basis of clinical um, symptomatology. But, um, but uh, I, I think it's, it's fun to see the reconnections in our practices. Well, you know, you know, Hahnemann told us in the earlier editions of the Organon in his early practice up to, up, up to, but before the fifth edition, um, and up to but not including the chronic diseases texts, that we should probably give a remedy once and wait and watch and judge our repetition based on what we see, okay? And later he qualifies that a bit, and he says we don't repeat a remedy when we're seeing progressive movement forward. And even when we're working with remedies in water, even when we're working with LMs or with a 30C in water or a 1M in water like this one might be, he says, in any noticeable and progressive improvement, don't repeat, even if we're setting us up to repeat, okay? But he says there's some diseases that just don't respond well like that. There's some diseases that get a dose of a remedy, and they don't seem to move forward. We don't see a change. And, there, and sometimes we can increase the potency and increase the number of pellets we give, and all the case does is shake and protest and aggravate and then not improve. And in cases like that, maybe we're better off to do gentle repetition and gentle nudges. And my metaphor that comes to mind with me in working case, with cases like this is, of course, being born in Wisconsin and spending most of my life in Maine is a car in a snowy ditch. You know, what do you do when a car is in a snowy ditch? Do you give it a 10M? Do you give it the hardest shove you can give? No, no. You give it gentle nudges, you know. As Claudia Schmidt, anybody out there know Claudia Schmidt? wrote this great song from Milwaukee. Great song. Rock that sucker if you want to get home tonight. 
Okay, that's how you get the car out of the ditch. So you rock that sucker. You give gentle, repetitive doses. And often this is the best way to go with some of these recalcitrant diseases. So when I'm working particularly with cases where there's there's pathological changes in the tissue, the body's got to make new tissue to make this different, okay? When I'm working especially with, with uh, autoimmune diseases, okay, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, ankylosing spondylitis, these kinds of things, um, I'm not going to give a single dose and expect the, the case to improve. Now, sometimes it does, but I think I see much better results when you rock that sucker. Take a gentle dose, give it in some repeated kind of form. Now, this can get difficult when you're giving the same potency time after time, whether it's in water or in pellet form. And Hahnemann's directions in the fifth edition of the Organon were that we give 30C pellets. He used 15, 30, 60C around that time. Give those pellets repeatedly to nudge the case along. And one of the things we can see when we're not changing the potency between each dose is accessory symptoms come up. Symptoms that belong to the remedy that don't belong to the patient. And those are a pain. They're difficult to deal with. In fact, the aphorism in the Organon where he explains how to deal with that is so confusing. I thought it was a translation issue until I asked my Austrian friends to translate it for me and tell me what he really means. And he said, yeah, we don't, we don't understand it either. Okay. So this is when he went to giving remedies in water because this gives you the opportunity to potentize between each dose. Okay. Gently succuss the solution between each dose and you're altering the potency subtly. And it's not that this problem goes away, but it becomes much less of an issue and these accessory symptoms um, move away. So this is my strategy again. You know, if I have a patient with uterine fibroids, you gotta remodel those tissues, okay? If I have a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, there's inflamed tissues, there's proliferated synovial tissue that has to be modified and changed, and the, ca the case does much better with these gentle repetitive doses. Well, you see, when you give nitroglycerin to somebody with angina, okay, that's, that's homeopathic, okay? Now, I know if I tell that to my cardiologist buddies, I'm gonna really tick them off, you know, because I've just called them a quack, okay, right? But seriously, it is. Now, did they know that it was homeopathic when they gave it? No, they didn't. So what about a batch flower remedy? We all call him Bach, you know, which it should have been because he was Welch, but he pronounced his name Batch. Well, he didn't intend them to be homeopathic. You know, Batch was not a homeopath. He, he was a bacteriologist, and he, he worked for many years at a homeopathic hospital and developed the bowel nosodes, but was really not a homeopath. And um, I think the batch flower remedies can be homeopathic when they are given homeopathically, okay? Now, whenever we get around to proving one of Batch's remedies, we basically confirm his symptomatology. He, he was... He was right, you know, go figure. Um, so, y you know, y for example, um, I recently had a, a great case of a woman who came in, looked for the world like a Thuya case, but the principal issue was procrastination. She puts everything off and she feels inadequate because she never begins what she be should begin. And if she does begin, she never finishes it. So I'm looking for a remedy that looks a lot like Thuya but uh, postpones everything to the next day, and I come across Larix decidua, okay, the European larch, another conifer. Um, we know very little bit about it, but if you read, if you read Batch's description of Larix, you'll see the most poignant description. I mean, look in the in the Richardson Bardler um, uh, texts for his description. It's a good place to access them. Um, you'll see the most poignant description of psychosis. Okay, you know, of which Thuya is the poster child. Um, and it starts reading just like Thuya until he gets to saying that the principal way in which they perceive themselves to be inadequate is they don't begin or finish projects. And they say, I am an inadequate person, not merely generally like Thuya, but specifically because I don't begin or finish projects. So I gave Lyric decidua. Now, I could give it in homeopathic potency, but in the past, I've had cases where I didn't have it in homeopathic potency, and so I gave the batch flower preparation, which is diluted but not potentized, right? And I just gave gentle repetitive doses of the batch flower 
uh, preparation instead. And it's worked fine. Oh, what a great question. Nothing systematic, but you know, it's interesting. Our best known remedies, the remedies we know best, have had the full range. For example, sulfur has seen provings from crude dose to high potency. Um, and and our, our big polycrests generally have. Um, an interesting case example might be Latrodectus mactans, the North American black widow spider, okay, where we have provings of toxicology, provings of bites, and then provings at 200 C, okay. And what we see is a very interesting thing. Both bring out very important properties of the remedy. The crude dose provings tend to bring out the in your face pathologies. Okay, we get the incredible spasm of the strided muscle. We get this feeling as if I'm having a heart attack. We get the priapism, et cetera, of Latrodectus. In the high potency, we get, we get well-defined fears. We get, we get twitchings of muscles. You know, we get the subtleties that help us understand what these crude in-your-face symptoms are about, okay? In Belladonna, in high potency, in high, excuse me, in crude dose provings of belladonna, we get abject fear, terror, and rage, and violence, okay? We get Van Damme movies from crude doses of belladonna, okay? In potency, we see that it's about dogs, okay? And we can understand the dynamics that it's about something that should be sweet and domestic is vicious and biting instead. Okay, and so we bring out the finer dimensions here. So crude dose and, and high potency provings complement each other nicely. And I would recommend if you're doing provings, I would make sure that you do the whole whole realm um, that we do. But, you know, the, the wildflowers from Mount Hood, I've been doing self provings of for the past number of years. Um, and I'll do, um, I'll, I'll do them drinking the, the washings of the mortar from the third trituration, like Herring did, and get wicked sick sometimes. And then I'll do them in a 30C because um, it's about the highest I, my elbow will stand when potentizing, okay? And, um, and it's interesting what comes out of those different potencies and provings. They're not different. They complement each other in bringing out the full story and picture of a remedy. Well, as long as we're at it, might as well throw the whole remedy kit in there. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know. Uh, I, yeah, I think it's an interesting idea. Um, I, I haven't done it. I know that there, there are people who do it. It may be a useful thing to do. Um, I kind of wonder about it though, because um, sometimes you'll see that uh, you know you give a, a potency and then you follow it too soon with another potency of the same remedy, and things get derailed. So um, I don't know about that. Um, so I, 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 I'm not sure why, I'm not sure why one would need to, and I'm and I would get confused about what might be the adverse effects of it. I'd like to see more work done on it. I know there's some people who advocate it. I haven't seen evidence based that this is better than giving a single potency. But it does remind me that Herring received a remedy kit from Gentian sent over from Europe um, early in his stay in Philadelphia. And it came over. Gentian's high potencies were prized in in Europe, and um, all the vials were broken in this wooden box. So Herring fished out the shards of glass and put all the pellets into one bottle and labeled it Universalinum. So, you know, um, so here combining different remedies. It's an interesting idea. I I know other people use this thing of saying. Um, take a 6C and follow a few minutes later with a 12C and then, a, you know, later in the day with a 30C and tomorrow with a 200, you know, and, and this kind of thing. Um, I don't know. You know, it's an interesting question of whether that has any improvement. I've not seen any evidence that it improves on our picking a good potency and giving it. What about the idea of antidoting? a high potency remedy with a lower potency of the same remedy? Yeah, people have said that can happen. And I think I've seen it happen in my, I don't think it's antidoting. I think it's interfering with the medicinal action. Okay, um, maybe we should get rid of the word antidoting because it doesn't just make things go away, but it changes the course of things. Okay, so some people, for example, will um, find that uh, if you have a similar aggravation, so you think you got the right remedy, 
but the similar aggravation is very unpleasant with the patient. After a 200C, why don't you give a 12C or a 30C or a 6C to mitigate that aggravation? And it seems to work. Um, my strategy, which seems to work a little bit better in my hands, is um, is to take, say if they aggravate on a 200C, dissolve the pellet in eight ounces of water and um, don't potentize it, just stir it gently and give a small teaspoon um, uh, or a small sip of that liquid. So you're giving a smaller dose at the same potency. And again, it seems to mitigate that aggravation. Doesn't Antidote doesn't stop it, but mitigates it. So this would be one of my concerns about giving serial potencies or, or a remedy that combines a number. I, is, is it possibly going to interfere in that same kind of way? I don't know. But I'm, I'm going to review some of these ideas in, in the course and talk about them. And um, I think one of the answers is we don't have the answers to a lot of these questions. Um, and maybe we should start listing the questions that need to be resolved in the next generation of homeopathy. Someone asked how to make a calendula tincture for the eyes. And I want to respond to that. You know, you don't want to put that alcohol in the eyes, do you? Of course. So what you can do, since you don't need a lot, do you? is you take your calendula tincture and you boil up some water on the stove or in your little electric coffee pot and put a little of that boiling water in a dish and, and put just a couple drops of the tincture in there. And most of the alcohol will boil off, not all of it, but enough and, and the rest will be diluted sufficiently that you can safely use this on the eyes. Okay, um, I use this in general, for example, to, um, to give herbal tinctures to uh, um, uh, to a vaginitis. You don't want that alcohol on the raw tissue from a yeast vaginitis. So put the tinctures into boiled water. Hot, it's still hot, still at the boiling point. And you'll, you'll see the alcohol quickly, you know, boils right out. And, um, and, and then you, you're okay using it. Or you can also obtain tinctures that are made in glycerates rather than in alcohol, which is really important for children or for folks where alcohol is an issue. Um, and you don't want to provide the taste of alcohol in their medicine. So great question. How do you determine the strength of the symptom picture? Oh goodness, that's one of my whole topics for the course. So that's going to take two hours to answer. <laughs> or to discuss and talk about so it comes out. So we're so do low down on the symptom hierarchy pyramid there that I think we might need to stay low. And, and low for two reasons. One is that I think a lot of people have suggested this and I think it's a reasonable suggestion is that a low potency is a blunt instrument. Okay, a low potency covers lots of breath. So with a low potency, you can get some good action if you're a kind of closicum. Okay, with a high potency is a narrow instrument, a very sharp instrument. And so if you're going to get a response to a, a high potency, you probably need a capital S3L similimum, you know, a really good similimum to see an action there. So here, where we're working on etiology, and maybe we have to be a little humble about our selection of a remedy and realize our, our confidence is not that great, we're probably better staying low. Okay. There's some other factors here. And one of those questions and that I want to address in depth in this upcoming course is, what does it mean when an organism is responding with only etiology and maybe a local expression? What does that mean? And what does that tell us about the pathology? What does that tell us about the vitality of the organism? And how does that inform us about what potency is might, might best be used in the case? I think when using LMs, it's probably best to stick to the standardized um, approach that Hahnemann did because the dilutions depend on globule size and globule number. Um, so that's an important piece. Um, otherwise, no, I, I don't think it makes much difference. And you know, for most of our patients of normal vitality, 
the difference between one pellet and ten pellets may be relatively inconsequential. Okay, um, for our sensitive patients, that may make a significant difference. Um, even for our average patient, though, the difference between one vial and a vial of pellets may be significant. Okay. What is potency? Well, I think what we have to do is go back and say, what did Hahnemann say potency is? So Hahnemann said potency derives out of that process of dilution and succussion, but it's not merely a material splitting up and lessening. It's a making immaterial, okay, which is what this word really means when it's translated out of his German. But it's making imma an, something immaterial of the intermittent medicinal powers by removing the covering of nature's forces, and that that uh, it involves liberating and vitalizing, freed from the fetters of matter, the medicinal properties of the substance. So I mean that's that's what it means, and and we can go from there in in speculating or 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 imagining what that may mean, but I think what Hahnemann is trying to say here is that we're we're actually creating a medicinal property that's 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 in some way more interesting than that in the original substance. Now, maybe the best example would be when we look at substances of common experience, like salt, okay, nature muraticum, like silica, beach sand, like gold, inert. You put it rings on it because it doesn't rust, you know. You put it in teeth because it doesn't corrode. So what about substances like this that we think of, uh, like a podium spore, you know, which was used because it was inert, you know, to dry up, you know, moist areas of the body and prevent bed sores and things. Um, when we go through this process of, of, of diluting and succussing or diluting and triturating, somehow we release some medicinal properties from these common everyday substances. And um, what does that mean? Um, I don't know. We don't have anything else like that that I know of in the world. Um, it, it, it's a it's a releasing of medicinal potence. So is that, is that sounded like a, 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 a circular answer? It was. Um, so I think we'd better wrap it up for tonight. And um, I really appreciate you all being here. And I look forward to the class a lot and and working with folks in this class and in future ones. I um, I, I want to thank you all because um, I get so jazzed and stimulated doing this. Um, I'm an introvert with an extrovert's job, and here I get to be extroverted while sitting here in front of my three computer screens in my pajamas, and um, it, it's, uh, it's the best of both worlds for me, and you guys stimulate me to think and produce this material, and um, uh, couldn't be anything finer, so I appreciate y'all. Keep it up. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>